Ah oh, man, guys, I'm watching the end of an era. It's the last of Richardson Reed's bookshelf tours. How am I going to survive? <laughs> Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Sign of the Four by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, or if you have my collection, The Sign of Four. It is finally in focus. So this is one of the Sherlock Holmes novels. I'm actually not sure what number it is in uh, in the series. Yes, this is the second book that was published. Um, so there are four novels and 56 short stories in the Sherlock Holmes canon. And this is the second novel published in 1890. I'm going to read the blurb from it. I abhor the dull routine of existence. That is why I have chosen my own particular profession, or rather created it, for I am the only one in the world. The only unofficial detective, I said, raising my eyebrows. The only unofficial consulting detective, he answered. I am the last and highest court of appeal in detection. Did you, did you like my Sherlock Holmes voice? At first, the interruption to the boredom of Sherlock Holmes seems to have little to do with crime, but there is mystery enough to intrigue the jaded detective. A governess, whose father vanished ten years ago and who has been receiving the gift of a valuable pearl, sent annually and anonymously, now needs an escort to meet her unknown benefactor. But before the night has ended, an impossible murder is discovered. Although Watson is bemused by love, Holmes is helped by Toby the Tracker Dog and the Baker Street Irregulars to hunt down a brutal killer and interpret the sign of four. So I am reading this as part of Catalyst Reads Rereadathon, and the February challenge is basically to reread a book that you read for schools. And I read this for uh, university, which is the same as college for you Americans. Uh, so I went to Roehampton University in southwest London, and I studied creative writing. And one of the modules I did was London in Literature, and we had to read this book for that module. And it was my uh, first ever Sir Arthur Conan Doyle book, so my first ever Sherlock Holmes as well, obviously. You may have made that deduction. I really enjoyed it at the time, and it's kind of what got me into Sherlock Holmes. I, I, after reading that, I then picked up the rest of the books and sort of went through them. I even read the uh, one of one of the new ones, which who was it wrote by? I think it was written by Anthony Horowitz, was it? I don't know. It was. It was the House of Silk by Anthony Horowitz. I read that. But yeah, at the time, I really enjoyed this, and I gave it a five out of five stars. And I have to say, rereading it for the rereadathon, which I did via an audio book, by the way, I'll link to that below. It was not the same, and I didn't enjoy it very much. I realised after, like this, this has kind of helped me to put it in perspective that I think this is now my least favourite Sherlock Holmes book, but it was kind of a favourite for a while in my head, purely because it was the first one that I read, and I do think now this might be the weakest one, at least for me. There were problems with it. There were lots of problems with it. It was racist. It was really racist. <laughs> like this was racist in a way that it, like it was actually racist as in as in like racism formed a part of the plot basically there was a, basically there was a, what i believe he would call let me find how let me find out exactly how sir arthur referred to this character i mean sir arthur conan doyle referred to him as a brown monkey-faced man he's a pygmy from africa basically he he kills somebody with a blow dart oh god oh god what are some of the other crazy... Oh, another way he described him, he also described him as the unhallowed dwarf with his hideous face. But it's not just this character as well, because there were some Sikhs in it as well. So he, he said, he said, he said they like to jabber away in their queer Sikh language. The narrator was doing the accent as well. He called them wild Punjabis. He used the word coolies. Like I not noted down every single one of these. A fat little round fellow with a turban. A great black bearded Sikh. The only good part of it is that Watson actually called him out though. Oh no, Watson didn't call him out for the racism though. Watson called him out for the uh, for the sexism. So Holmes said, women are never to be entirely trusted. Not the best of them. And then Watson called him out on it being like, hey, you cannot generalize about all women. But if you want to talk about the dwarf with his unhallowed face and my girlfriend was listening to this with me as well and she's not read any Sherlock Holmes and so we had the audiobook on and she was just helping me to pull out all of these like crazily in politically incorrect terms that just made as a reader now it made me feel really uncomfortable a savage one of those Indians these are all genuine quotes from this book <laughs> like what the f a street Arab there were street Arabs oh god 
Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's safe to say there were problems with this. I mean, there were some redeeming features as well. What was quite interesting with this is this is kind of the one that introduced Holmes' drug problem. So Holmes had track marks on his arms and the book begins and ends with him doing cocaine. Right, what I've never, never understood is why he does cocaine. Because he does cocaine as like something to keep him going between cases. But cocaine would just really amp you up and make you want to solve more cases. Like cocaine would be the drug he would be doing while he was solving the cases. And then when nothing comes in, that's when he should be switching to smoking opium. Like I don't get it. But anyway, it starts and ends with him doing cocaine, which is always good. So basically, for the first half, we kind of solve the crime in the first half. And then the second half is discovering why the crime was committed and all the ins and outs of it and being racist. So there is quite a good scene, though, where they race along the Thames. Although the problem with the audio book that I had was that I zoned in and out of it a lot as well. And partly, I guess, because I've read it before. But if I'd not read this before and I was going only from my experience of the audiobook, I would have had no idea what was happening throughout it. And my girlfriend didn't. She was By the end of it, she was like, I just I don't understand what happened. A, 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 an African pygmy killed somebody. Spoiler. <laughs> yeah. This also features the great quote, My mind rebels at stagnation. Give me problems. Give me work. Which I've quoted somewhere else as well. That's a great quote. I think that's my favourite Sherlock Holmes quote. It also self-refers to a study in Scarlet, which is the first Holmes book. Because basically Watson wrote it up as kind of a memoir of the case, I guess. Which is obviously the book that we end up reading. And, uh... And Holmes didn't like it. <laughs> oh yeah, one thing I did find with the audiobook is that the, the narrator actually made Holmes more insufferable. Like, the guy's voice. Oh, I just hated it. And every time he was doing Holmes' voice, he just made Holmes sound like a right old asshole, which I guess he was a little bit. But when you read it, you kind of, you know, I almost look up to him, I think. And with the, with the audiobook, you want to hit him in the eye. It also... It suffered from a bit of the John Green effect, so in my review of uh, Turtles All the Way Down, I, I pointed out that one of the characters, the line was like, blah 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 blah, she said, askingly, which is just ridiculous. And in this, somebody said something laughingly, which is also ridiculous. Sorry, let me try and say that laughingly, <laughs> which is also ridiculous. Ha <laughs> ha! Ha ha! We keep that footage in because it's really embarrassing. <laughs> One thing that Holmes did say, and this is for you, Miriam, I don't know if you're watching, but Miriam for Between Lines and Life, she's a big uh, Goethe fan, I think that's how you say it, and uh, yeah, the quote in this was, Goethe is always pithy, which I believe I said that right as well, I mean, Goethe and pithy are both not necessarily commonplace words, I bet there are people watching this who don't know what one or two of those words even means. One final thing I did like is that Holmes could tell that Watson's brother had been a drunk because there were marks on his watch from where he drunkenly tried to wind the watch up, which obviously you wouldn't really get now, but I can, I can kind of see how if you were trying to wind a watch up and you were drunk, you would leave marks. <laughs> it's still Sherlock Holmes and it's still enjoyable enough. It's definitely gone down a lot in my estimations based on this reread and I was disappointed by it because I was expecting to love it and I was hoping that it would get my girlfriend into reading the Sherlock Holmes books and make her want to read more of them and instead she's just kind of been put off by it by the whole experience really uh, so I, it's definitely not one to start with I also think the whole whodunit element of it is kind of redundant because you you could maybe guess who did it which takes you up to about a third of the way through but then the remaining two thirds is all about why he did it, and you will never guess that. It's not something you can guess because it's an entire backstory. He did it with the Valley of Fear as well, so that you have the crime, and it gets solved halfway through, and the second half is why the crime happened. And so it almost reads like two different books, because the first half is very much could be who done it, and you as a reader try and figure it out. And then the second half is more of a passive experience where you just read why they did it, because there's no point trying to guess. I'm gonna give it a three out of five. So, yeah, that's what I, th what I thought about it on this reread. Now, what do we have next? Because I don't know what is next. Oh, this is exciting. Okay, so for March, my March rereadathon book, the challenge is reread a non-fiction book, autobiography, and a memoir. So as I've mentioned in the past, um, I'm doing audiobooks, and I'm doing one book a month. So just the one book, and I'm going to do... Chronicles Volume 1 by Bob Dylan, which is Bob Dylan's autobiography. So very excited about that. I'm looking forward to it. 
So anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Be sure to let me know with a comment what you think of The Sign of Four if you've read it. And also, if you're taking part in the rereadathon this month, let me know what your reread is. And in the meantime, please do hit subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you soon for more bookish videos. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.